This is me trying to look intellectual and yeah, I'm failing, aren't I, for two reasons. One, oh, that really hurts my eyes. Uh, and two, it doesn't matter what glasses you put on me, I can never look intellectual. I just look like a nerd in all glasses, it seems. Uh, now then, this video, though, is going to try to be at least a little bit intellectual and has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More of that later. Now, um, I'm going to talk about live-action roleplay gaming and I'm going to refer to it as an art form and a lot of people might be thinking, nah, live-action roleplay, that's, that's not an art form. That's just a load of people dressing up and running around in the woods uh, pretending to be um, knights in armour or whatever and rescue princesses, killing monsters and, and stealing treasure. That's not an art form, that's just larking about and frankly it's rather immature. Well, I think a lot of LARP is just dressing up and larking about like that, but that doesn't mean that it has to be like that. You know, a lot of art is bad, a lot of films are bad, a lot of books aren't intellectual, but a roleplay gaming scenario can be about something, can be trying to make a point, can explore a theme, uh, can make people really think about stuff. Um, now, some people have uh, tried to uh, explore the intellectual side of it. This is um, IF, Interactive Fantasy. This was uh, published in 1995. Uh, this magazine didn't run for very long. It is just achingly intellectual. Look, look, see, no pictures. No pictures. It's a role-playing gaming magazine with no pictures. And, and uh, uh, listen to the, uh, the, the titles of the, uh, of the articles. They're, they're called things like Leaping into Cross-Gender Roleplay, um, The Blind Games Master, The Nihilist Roleplayer, Through a Mask Darkly, Foreign Language Education and Role-Playing Games, When a Touch Becomes a Bruise, uh, that's about using roleplay gaming as, as, as therapy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't feel the need to buy any more issues of this. Although I, you know, I'm, I'm glad to have had this. I'm, I'm glad to have read it. It was you know, uh, diverting to a degree, but um, I, I don't think it quite uh, went for the fun in quite the way that, uh, that other roleplay games and magazines do. Now, live action roleplay gaming is an art form in that uh, people are acting, they're playing a part, they're not playing themselves, they are creating stories, uh, but it's an odd art form that normally uh, we think of art as something that artists do, uh, perhaps for the benefit of people who are not artists. So a sculptor sculpts a sculpture and then puts it up and other people come along and look at it. They're not sculptors, but they look at it and go, hmm, sculpture. Um, so they're appreciate it, but in live action role play, the artists are also the audience. You're, it's a completely participatory uh, art form, and everyone uh, involved, they are their own audience. Um, and I think, though, that I have learned things about, yes, human nature from having done some live action role play, which I haven't done much of in recent years, but I used to do quite a lot. Um, the main system I played was called, because I know I'm going to be asked, Fools and Heroes. Um, and it was set in the usual sort of Tolkien-esque uh, medieval fantasy. Um, there are orcs and wizards and spells and, oh, you know, all the usual stuff. Um, and I created a character called Agin. Actually, uh, when I first created him, I think I was going to have it pronounced Agin, but that quickly went, to, uh, went by the wayside because everyone started calling him Agin, the name stuck. So he was called Agin. And my idea for Agin was that he would be the ultimate exploitable character. Uh, to make him very exploitable, I made him intensely stupid. Um, I also made him very trusting. And I also made him very easily provoked to anger. So with those three characteristics, I thought, wow, he's going to get exploited. This is going to be fun, playing someone who keeps getting exploited by all the people around him. But it didn't happen. You see, I think it's partly to do with the fact that I played him with a sort of childlike stupidity and trustingness, and perhaps the childlikeness of him made people look after him. But whatever it was, people looked after me when I was playing Egan. Now, when I'm playing with my local branch, the people there, they know Lloyd, and they encounter Egan, and they think that I'm going to behave a bit like Lloyd does. Um, so in the middle of a fight, for instance, if there was something that clearly needed doing and that Lloyd surely could, should, should be able to see that, that that needs doing, so why doesn't he do it? I didn't do it because I was playing Egan and Egan was too thick to notice that a certain thing needed doing. Um, and so sometimes people didn't look after him and didn't uh, use him as a resource uh, very well, uh, but they did look after him more socially, even if not always tactically. Um, it's different, of course, when I went to a fest. A fest was a, a weekend-long festival that would be held somewhere else in the country and you'd travel out and you'd meet people who travelled from around the country and they didn't know Lloyd. They didn't know me. They met me as Egan. So they didn't 
expect me to know what to do in certain situations. They had to look at Agen and see how does he behave and judge accordingly. Now, one idea I had, uh, it was just for the fun of it, was that I was going to confuse pennies and shillings. It was, I think, 12 pence to the shilling. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll see if I can get diddled here. Uh, so when someone paid me some pennies for something, I would give them change in shillings, you see. So if they said nothing, they would end up a lot richer than they started and I would end up a lot poorer. It never happened. However, much to my surprise, as soon as I, Lloyd that is, tried to, as Agin, get swindled, because I just thought it would be fun, um, someone would come along and, whoa, what's going on here? No, 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 hang on, no, 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 it's, it, it's all right, Agin, yeah, it's, it's 12 pennies to the shilling, not the other, right. he's, he's a little bit slow, it's all right, it's all right, Agin, I'll sort you out. This was something that had never happened, that doesn't happen to me. People don't, be don't behave like that with me. No one comes along and, and sees that Lloyd's all right because, you know, Lloyd needs looking after. People generally assume, oh, he's Lloyd, he'll be, he'll be fine. He needs no one. And uh, so it was, it was, whoa, this is an eye-opener. I, I created this guy who was actually, as I say, very quick to anger. And, and when he was angry, he got really violent very quickly. And yet, People seem to accept him. Now, he did eventually die, it's true, uh, when he went out adventuring with a group of people who didn't know him and they didn't look after him and they didn't know how to use him. And But never mind. Um, the point is that it was an eye-opener for me about that the, the human nature looks after people who might be exploitable. Um, so I, I was actually trying to be exploited. That is to say, Lloyd was trying to get Agin exploited Agin wasn't trying to be exploited, um, and it almost, almost never happened. Uh, there were a couple of times when, for instance, uh, in my local branch, a lot of people thought that it was a great wheeze to uh, be members of the Thieves Guild, and so they nicked a few things off him, which was, it was just annoying and, and actually really wasn't very clever. I, one thing that got nicked off him was a shield, his massive shield. He had a big, distinctive shield that he was very good at using, and uh, it got nicked in a courtroom. And when I noticed it, it was missing a couple of minutes later and I asked about it, uh, they would say, oh, no, it's gone, it's been fenced, it's all gone. Fenced? Really? Fenced? Imagine, there's a large, handmade, extremely well, everybody in the local town that was called Newcroft, everybody would know, that's, that's Agin Shield. That, and, and he was, at one point, he was head of the Physicians Guild. Yeah, I... Thought it would be funny if he became head of the Physicians Guild, and largely because just the other people who could have been head of the Physicians Guild all sort of died. I didn't kill him. Um, I ended up uh, head of the Physicians Guild. So they were the head of the Physicians Guild, who's an extremely well-known local adventurer, has this extremely large and distinctive shield with a distinctive pattern on it. How would you fence that in a medieval town? Everybody would recognise it. No one would touch it. You couldn't use it. As soon as you got it out, everyone would say, whoa, that's, I know that shield. That's, that's, that's Agen and shield. Right, guard, guard, come how fenced. I hadn't thought, you know, modern modern things like, like this pot of glue, for instance, modern things can be fenced because myriads of things exactly like this exist. So it's very easy to fence uh, a modern manufactured good. But you, you try fencing a, uh, the, the, an expensive shield or suit of armour or something in a small medieval town, I don't think you'd get very far. You know, so if you do find yourself time travelling, do please be aware of that. And besides, stealing is wrong. Um, that was a bit of a sidetrack, wasn't it? Yes, so, Agin. Um, I had one set of expectations for how I was going to be treated, and they were confounded, and it was quite an eye-opener. And I go, oh, okay, so this is how people instinctively react to other people. This is what it's like to be a different person. Um, so it was particularly interesting when I went to fests where people didn't know me, the real me, Lloyd. Um, now, if you're watching this video, uh, then you're probably interested in role-play gaming and so forth, and heroes and adventures and all the rest of it. In which case, you might be interested in a lecture course that's on The Great Courses Plus. Yes, uh, it's called uh, Heroes and Legends, the most influential characters in literature. And it's, uh, it's, it's presented by Professor uh, Thomas Shippey. And um, I know what you're going to ask, because, you know, does he have a good scholar's cradle? Well, do you know what? He, he really, he keeps you on the edge of his seat because he keeps apparently going for it. Look, look you see, he keeps going for it. You see, what, it's, is it going? And then he doesn't. And I won't tell you what happens in the end. I won't, I won't spoil, no spoilers on the, on the Scholar's Cradle thing. But whew, I tell you, it's, it's edge of your seat stuff with that, with regard to that. So um, he uh, has um, 
of course with loads of characters in it. He starts with Frodo Baggins, uh, which may appeal to, to some of you, uh, and ends with Harry Potter, just to keep it, you know, modern and down with the kids. Uh, but there's uh, James Bond and Don Quixote and Elizabeth Bennet and uh, Aeneas and Odysseus and Thor, Dracula, Sherlock Holmes, a lot of the, well, you know, the most influential characters in literature. And he looks at why we find them interesting and why they are lasting, why people keep going back to them again and again. So you might find that uh, interesting. Then again, you may find loads of other courses um, interesting and you could enjoy them for an entire month free by going to www thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige and there you'll find all the details of a one month free trial. So during that one month you could watch several courses. You wouldn't be able to watch them all because the courses tend to be about 12 hours long in half hour chunks and there are quite a lot of courses but you can find courses on all sorts of topics. There's bound to be something that you like and I have to say that uh, I'm very pleased that I, I'm still getting a steady trickle of emails from people saying that um, they've tried out The Great Courses Plus and have been very pleased with it and I think it's a great uh, fit for my uh, my channel. So that's all very pleasing. So the Great Courses Plus, why not give it a go? Uh, now the other character that I created uh, was called Barkin. Actually he was called Hal Barkin but he always introduced himself as Barkin and just once, just once, he told someone who had shown him some kindness, some rare kindness, he told them his name was Hal. Ha! Huh, touching moment! But um, uh, to everyone else he was Barkin. Now Barkin was a guy with a massive chip on his shoulder. He was absolutely convinced that all people in power were greedy, corrupt and cruel and that they were out to subjugate the masses and uh, that that's the way the world was. And uh, he was a miserable git who had pretty much given up on his ever being happy himself. Uh, but he was able to keep going. The, the, the thing which, which made him get up in the morning and do stuff was that he thought at least he could do something to help the poor, help those in need, and perhaps do something to bring down the system, the swines. Um, and isn't it interesting that immediately, and I mean immediately, right from the start, the very first time I ever played him, immediately everyone assumed that he was a wrong un, and everyone treated him absolutely like dirt. He got treated exactly the way he expected to be treated, or tret as they say in the northeast um, of England. They, uh, and so in some ways I'm learning a different lesson here, So because if you remember Egan got uh, treated a way, in a way that I wasn't expecting, whereas this guy, he got treated exactly as he was expecting. Although I, Lloyd, um, I found that interesting. I, I wasn't expecting him to be treated quite that, that way immediately but oh yes. Um, why do people think for instance that he was a member of the Thieves Guild? I mean would an actual member of the Thieves Guild behave that way? Who would make you know throw suspicion upon himself? He was surly but he was also selfless and tireless and my goodness the amount of running I did as, a, as, as Barkin I would I would run miles around to get back behind the enemy. I would scout. I would, I would go scouting off on my own for, uh, way out of sight of the party. Um, and I can I just say, by the way, that if someone does go to all the effort of, of deep scouting for a party, could you not, if you're one of the other members of the party, not give his position away? The number of times there'd be some some evil villain with his henchmen, and the, the villain will be standing there and saying, well, I shall destroy you all, or whatever it is, and that he, he had his arc of henchmen in front of him, going, yeah, yeah, with clubs and so forth. And I would, I would, I would withdraw, I would run all the way around, I would get behind and I would sneak right up behind it and I was just about to belt the, the, the leader of the opposition over the back of the head and then one of my own team would say there's another one there and give my position away and then I, I lost count of the time that happened so please don't do that. Uh, another digression. Um, so he got treated exactly as he expected to be. Everyone um, assumed he was a wrong one and on one mission when he was involved in trying to rescue a load of villagers from I uh, forget what threat now but it involved a load of corrupt guards um, he got arrested for assaulting the guards um, none of whom died by the way he just knocked them out uh, and uh, thrown in prison and the, the, the trial judge was also a priest of Sive, the god of justice and balance and fairness and neutrality and uh, he was a very self-righteous uh, character and uh, I was a very non-cooperative prisoner 
and uh, there I was lying in my cell and the cell door opened one night and in came some guards and the priest of Sidhe to interrogate me and I was totally non-cooperative so um, he ordered the guards to give me a sound kicking and so there I was role-playing being beaten up being given a very very thorough kicking and he just stood there and watched so when I turned up to the trial I had one eye I couldn't open one eye because it was just so swollen and I, I couldn't stand up properly because my I, I had some broken ribs and um, the boos I got as I walked into the courtroom, the jeers from the gallery. We actually role played out the whole the, the whole court scene in in a debating chamber at the university, and people were booing and saying, "Yeah, he fell. He's acting." Blah 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 blah. Got to the front, and I swore by Sive. I swore by the God of the Judge who was looking down on me that I would tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And that actually quietened the courtroom down quite a bit. Ooh. He's just swore by the God of the judge. Ooh. And I mentioned that I had, for instance, being beat, I was beaten up in my cell on the orders of and witnessed by the judge. And he didn't deny it. Yep. Then there was quite a hush in the courtroom. Ooh. Um, rather nice moment. Uh, anyway, um, he was a very biased judge. I'm not uh, annoyed with the guy playing him for that because he was playing a biased judge. Um, and I got sold into slavery. Now, a lot of people used to retire their characters when they got sold into slavery and start a new character because who wants to play a slave? For me, it was great. Um, I got to play a slave, so I'd been sold into slavery. It was just more bad stuff being dumped on me. It was just bad stuff happened to me all the time. Now, the way you progressed in the system was you joined guilds and churches, uh, but I joined no guild and I joined no church because I didn't believe in all that sort of thing. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're just a load of... You know, oppressive, greedy organizations, self-serving swines, etc. You know, up, smash the system. That's the sort of guy I was. So uh, I joined none. And then I was sold into slavery, became uh, the slave of a player character. He then went on adventures and I would then go along with him as his slave. And I went to a fest uh, down south that was, um, its official name was Winterfest, but it became known as Killfest. Uh, the people running the national campaign had decided that there were far too many powerful wizards in system and that they had to had to uh, thin the crop a bit. Um, and so they designed the scenarios with that aim in mind and failed spectacularly. At the, the big climactic battle, no wizards died. They were at the back and they all ran away. And all the soldiers who formed the front line died in that line. It's quite rare. You actually saw this, this formation of dead soldiers. Um, and uh, I was the big hero of the day because I killed the big, big, biggity, big, bad monster that was unkillable by all sorts of means, armed with a magic brooch. Yep, didn't even have a knife on me. I just had a magic brooch. I had to run up to it and, and, and jam this brooch up against it. I jammed it right onto his forehead, I remember, just right there. Uh, and uh, boom, it exploded, taking me uh, with it. Well, you're dead, said the ref. By the way, if you are a ref, don't say, well, you're dead, and then go on to the next thing. You know, that was my big moment of glory. You should, you know, describe the explosion. Describe how my, my, my ribs fly in different directions. I don't know, it was my blaze. If, I, if you're going to go out in a blaze of glory, the ref should describe a blaze of glory, not just say, right, uh, you're dead, and then move on. So I, I felt a little short change there. But anyway, um, so he died. Uh, and uh, then... After the mages eventually came back and they salvaged a load of the bodies, they found that between them they had uh, enough power to, to resurrect five people. All their head priests and mages and, and, and alchemists and so forth got together and they had enough power, magical power between them, to resurrect five people. So there was a debate, which five? Because we, <laughs> there were, I, I don't know, 50 dead people, something like that. Uh, maybe it wasn't 50, it was a lot though. And, um, and I was told afterwards that someone, oh, I, I argued, you know, the case for you, but yeah, not very hard. Some people argued token case for him, but there you go. I learned another thing. Uh, all the people who got resurrected were uh, powerful and with powerful friends. Yeah. Uh, big surprise. Eh? Yeah. So there you go. There, there's there's, the, there's, the, there's the, the rich and the powerful. Yeah. When, it, you know, when, when, the, when the feces hits the fan, they all club together, the swine.